Okay, so welcome everyone to again to our research webinar series. Uh, we are very happy today to have Professor Benjamin Moll uh, to talk about monetary policy according to Hank. Uh, ben has received his PhD from the University of Chicago, and after that he has been a, a professor at Princeton University. His research interest is a focus on understanding cross-country income differences and also understanding the, the impact of heterogeneity in income and wealth, how they affect the macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomy and macroeconomic policy, and this is one of the papers he's going to present to us. His research has been published in journals of the American Economic Review, the Journal of Political Economy, Review of Economic Dynamics, among others. And he's now the Associate Professor of Economics and International Affairs at Princeton University. So without further ado, the floor is yours. And also feel free to ask questions. There is a, a chat box, so you can type your questions there, and then he's going to answer them uh, as when, when he deems convenient. Thank you, Ben. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Francisco. Uh, really great to be here. Um, this is my first webinar. I'll try to take questions, can't promise I'll take all of them. Um, also, happy Halloween. It's Halloween in the US, so uh, let's go. Um, okay, so this is a uh, joint work with uh, Greg and uh, Gianluca, I should say. Um, so let's see, I'm done. Okay, so um, the title, if you looked at the paper before, is I guess not that much of a secret anymore. So Hank here um, stands for recent literature that marries uh, Buley type incomplete markets models and um, New Keynesian models, and we like this acronym Hank and think that should be a, the official name from now on. Okay, so our, our framework that I'll show you is a uh, new framework for the quantitative analysis of, uh, at a broad level, um, how analyzing how the macroeconomy responds to shocks and macroeconomic policy, and what we'll focus on today is uh, monetary policy. Um, just to already throw it out there, the framework is going to have three main building blocks. Um, the first main building block is sort of the um, HA in Hank, so that's uh, some form of uninsurable idiosyncratic income risk that's simply motivated by by the fact uh, that there's a lot of uh, inequality in the income and wealth, say. The second one is uh, uh, the NK in Hank, so some form of sticky prices. Uh, why is that there? That's there to get some sort of notion of aggregate demand of the ground. Finally, the third thing is something a bit more specific to our specific uh, Hank model, and that's uh, something building on Greg and Gianluca's previous work, uh, namely assets with the different degrees of liquidity. Okay, so um, our starting point is uh, really a striking observation about how monetary policy works, um, not in this type of Hank models I'll talk about, but instead in uh, the sort of standard textbook representative agent New Keynesian model. Um, and to poke a little fun, we like to call that rank. Um, so now <clears throat> our paper is going to be about uh, the transmission of monetary policy to the largest component of GDP. That's aggregate consumption. Um, and for everything we're going to do, we're going to take as given that the central bank can somehow affect real rates. Okay. Um, so forget about zero lower bound or anything like that. That's not what our paper is about. So given that, um, if uh, the central bank cuts normal rates, then real rates fall, you'd expect consumption to increase, right? And uh, we find this, uh, we find it useful to decompose this into uh, what we call direct effects and indirect effects. Direct effects are just, you know, interest rates fall, people save less or borrow more and therefore increase their consumption. Um, indirect effects are that uh, because there's some sticky prices, um, some nominal rigidities, aggregate demand is going to go up in response to this, um, and uh, this leads to higher household uh, income, and that leads to additional increases in consumption. Now it turns out that in the uh, standard uh, New Keynesian model, so this rank model, um, the direct response here, so this first bullet here, is really everything. Um, and if you calibrate this kind of model, you get something like the numbers that are on the slide here. So something like 95% of the overall response are the direct effect and only 5% are the indirect effect. Um, and uh, the reason for this is that this is, of course, just a pure intertemporal substitution effect. There's a representative agent. He's on this Euler equation. 
and uh, and he just responds very strongly to interest rate changes. I should also say, so these numbers here, they're for a very simple sort of three equation model, sort of from Woodford or Galley's textbook. And the same is actually also true uh, if you go to more, to bigger sort of medium scale DSG models. For example, in the paper, we do this for the Smets and Waters model, and we show that the same sort of decomposition holds. Another way of saying this for uh, those of you who remember the sort of old Keynesian economics from, uh, from, from their undergrad days um, is that uh, the new Keynesian model really has a tiny multiplier, okay? Um, so so um, it's, it's all just about the impulse and not the multiplier. Um, now, what we want to argue is that this view of the world sort of warrants some skepticism, okay? So the first of all, uh, I think it would be a stretch to argue that empirical uh, evidence has found any strong evidence of direct effects of interest rates on consumption. Okay. Um, second, um, and here I think the evidence is really strong, um, empirical studies typically find very strong uh, sensitivity of income changes to aggregate consumption. Okay. Another way of saying this is households in the data seem to respond much more strongly to transitory income changes than uh, models based on the permanent income hypothesis like these representative Asian New Keynesian models uh, suggest. Okay, so people in the data have MPCs that are way higher than what these kind of uh, models uh, suggest. Finally, um, uh, there's also some, some evidence at the more micro level, which is that um, these, these sensitivities, so both uh, the sensitivity to interest rate changes and the sensitivity to income changes, and they tend to be vastly heterogeneous, okay? And in particular, and they tend to depend on household balance sheets. So to give you a simple example, in the US economy, there's a fair amount of households, uh, like 10 or 20%, that just don't participate in asset markets, right? They don't hold any assets or liabilities. Um, so then, as a result, um, it's not surprising that, I mean, you, you'd basically expect they wouldn't uh, respond to interest rate changes, right? I mean, and, and that's kind of exactly what you see. Okay. so. Here's where our friend uh, Hank comes in. So this heterogeneous Asian New Keynesian model. Um, and so the key idea is we're going to try to build a model that's uh, consistent with the empirical evidence on the previous slide. Okay. And once we sort of calibrate this model to be consistent with these facts, um, our Hank framework is going to uh, deliver two important things. And the first thing is a realistic wealth distribution. And the second thing is a realistic distribution of MPCs, so these are high MPCs. Um, to, to really like sort of focus your minds, so the key thing that we're gonna have is we're gonna have basically roughly 30% of the population that are gonna be up against some sort of constraint, okay? So as a result, you can see uh, if you're up against a constraint, you're gonna respond strongly to income changes and you're not gonna respond strongly to interest rate changes, okay? So then, um, given this, we have sort of small direct effects, and we have large indirect effects here, a little bit depending on what happens to household disposable income. Okay, um, the first main result given this then is that sort of the, the relative importance of these um, direct and indirect effects is completely reversed, right? So here in, in blue are the numbers from the rank model. Um, so in the rank model, you had 95% uh, direct effects. In the Hank model, you only have roughly a third direct effects. Um, the, the second main result, so this is about a decomposition, right? Uh, doesn't tell you anything about the overall if, um, responsiveness of consumption with respect to interest rate changes, like something like the overall elasticity of consumption to interest rate changes, just tells you the decomposition. Um, we also have something about the overall effect, and there, uh, basically, the result is that it can go either way, okay? So it can be either smaller or larger than in the rank model. Um, the key thing sort of is that at a meta level sort of this this overall responsiveness is going to uh, depend on all all sorts of little things that wouldn't matter basically in a in a ranked model okay so in particular it's going to depend on everything that determines what happens to household disposable income because that matters that's what really what matters for uh, for the consumption response okay um and there's a lot of different things like this. For example, it matters what the investment does. It matters how fluid labor markets are and so on. But there's one thing that we kind of thought was particularly interesting that we're kind of emphasizing. Um, and in particular, that's 
that the overall consumption response to monetary policy uh, depends on what fiscal policy does. Okay, um, so the, here's and here's how to think about this. Um, so even in a representative Asian New Keynesian model, um, as soon as the government has debt, uh, you get that uh, monetary policy has to induce a fiscal response, right? So in particular, um, if the government cuts interest rates and the government has some debt, that's great for the government because it has to pay less interest on its debt. It's got to do something with that money, okay? And uh, the, the, the key thing, so, so in particular, it can really basically do three things with that money, right? It can either uh, save this windfall or it can um, spend it or it can give it back to households in the form of lower taxes. Um, the key result in a representative Asian New Keynesian model is that uh, Ricardo equivalence holds, um, and therefore uh, doesn't matter what the government does exactly out of these three options with the windfall. They're all kind of equivalent. Um, in contrast, in our represent in our heterogeneous Asian New Keynesian model, sorry, um, as I've already told you, there's going to be a lot of people up against constraints. As a result, Ricardo equivalence fails, and therefore it's going to matter a whole lot what uh, the fiscal policy response is to monetary policy, okay? But as I've already said, this is sort of really just a, a one particular uh, sort of uh, example of a more broader thing, which is that all, all things that determine what happens to household disposable income matter. Okay, so let me briefly talk about the literature very briefly. So obviously we combine sort of two workhorse moder models of modern macroeconomics. Um, the first one is these new Keynesian models, um, and the second one are, are Bewley models. Um, something a bit more specific, there's sort of two strands of the literature I want to highlight. The first one is sort of uh, new Keynesian models with some form of limited heterogeneity. In particular, I'm thinking here of, uh, people may have seen these, um, new Keynesian models that incorporate uh, this sort of campbell mankiw type spender-saver behavior. Um, so the way these models work, right, is that um, it's a basically a standard New Keynesian model, but just rather than being one representative agent, there's two types of agents. Um, and there's the spenders and there's the savers. So the spenders are just basically people who are, live hand to mouth every period, and they just have uh, an MPC of one every period. Instead, the savers are just exactly like the representative agent in the standard New Keynesian model that are on their Euler equation. Okay, and if you want, you can think of our sort of richer model as sort of a micro foundation of this type of spender-saver behavior, because in our model, it's going to basically uh, arise endogenously um, rather than sort of being uh, imposed um, from, from the outside. Um, and so it's, it's basically empirically more realistic. There's also going to be some, some quantitative difference in the results. I'll talk about this later. Um, the second strand of result related literature is uh, Bewley models with sticky prices, so other Hank models, if you want. Relative to that literature, what we bring to the table is really um, these assets with different degrees of liquidity. I've already said this. Um, so this is based on Greg and John Lucas' previous work, and I'll tell you exactly what this does. Um, second, we kind of take on board uh, something we think is important, which is a, a new view of individual earnings risk that's sort of been documented by uh, Patti Guvenen and co-authors, for example, this nice paper here by Guvenen, Karen, Oskin, and Song. Um, and they show that basically individual earnings risk at the micro level uh, looks nothing like what people typically feed into the models, namely sort of normally distributed shocks. Instead, these things sort of uh, are, are very fat-tailed, um, and for a lot of people, there's basically no risk, and for some people, there's massive risk. Okay, finally, it's in continuous time um, for no reason except that it's going to make things easier to solve. Okay, so let me uh, dive straight in. Um, this is sort of the main uh, important slide of the paper, I think. So this is where it it's worth paying attention. Um, and this slide is basically uh, where we explain what the households look like in our model. Um, the rest of the model, we really try to stay as close as possible to the standard representative agent New Keynesian model. So in particular, you know, if you know the three equation model, say take the three equation model from Gali's textbook, and basically what we do is we take out the Euler equation, we kind of throw it away, and we replace it with this more realistic and rich uh, household side of, of the economy. The other two equations, the Phillips curve and the Taylor rule, we kind of keep the same more or less. Okay. So the households here, 
Um, they face uh, some uninsured idiosyncratic labor income risk and they consume and supply labor. Uh, so far, it's basically just a, a Julie model, an Iagari model with labor supply. And then comes to something more special, somewhat more special thing, which is that they hold these two different types of assets. In particular, there's some assets that are liquid and some assets that are illiquid. And just to be clear, so you have something in your heads, when I say liquid, I mean uh, basically what's in your checking or your saving account. And when I say illiquid, I mean your house and uh, depending which country you live in, uh, maybe also your retirement account. So in the US, for example, um, illiquid assets held in retirement accounts are a big deal. I'll show you that later. Uh, there's also other smaller things, but these are the two big items or the, the few big items that are in the flow of funds, which we'll talk about, which, we're, which we'll focus on later. Okay, so uh, here come the most uh, important equations of the paper. Um, these are the budget constraints um, of uh, these households. Okay. Uh, here I'm simplifying along a number of uh, dimensions. Um, the first thing is, so I've already said this, the, the households here are heterogeneous, like in a standard heterogeneous Asian models. All these variables should really have I subscripts on them, okay? So it should be B, I, T, and A, I, T, and so on. Um, the other thing I'm simplifying here is that here I'm writing the equations for a stationary equilibrium, okay? So in particular, there's three prices in here, R, B, R, A, and W. So liquid return, illiquid return, and the wage. And uh, they don't, as you can see, they don't have time subscript them on them. And that's because I'm writing the equations for stationary equilibrium. Later on, I'll, we're obviously going to be uh, interested in the response of the economy to monetary policy. Um, and then the economy is going to move around over time. And therefore, these prices are going to move around over time. OK. So. The, the key important thing is there's these two assets, uh, liquid assets would be denoted by B and illiquid assets which be denoted by, which we denote by A, right? So let's focus on the first uh, constraint, the evolution for the liquid assets B first. So th that equation here, uh, let me take this arrow here. That equation, right, says that, um, that uh, the savings in liquid assets are your interest income in liquid assets plus uh, your labor income um, minus um, some consumption. I'm sorry, so the labor income here consists of a wage, then it consists of your idiosyncratic labor productivity, and then it consists of your labor supply, that's L. So idiosyncratic labor productivity, here's Z, okay? Um, that's gonna be this governance stuff later, right? That's the underlying risk in the economy that drives things, okay, just to be clear. Um, uh, so, so interest income, labor income, um, consumption, and then you can take some of your liquid assets, okay, and you can deposit them into the illiquid assets. So that's what we call D here. Uh, in particular, if you uh, deposit uh, your 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 things in your illiquid asset, um, you're going to get a higher return R A um, than R B. Okay, so these are these these returns are A and R B are determined in equilibrium, but one is endogenously going to be higher than the other. Um, and you know what? Uh, so why doesn't everyone just put uh, all their money in the liquid asset? Well, the answer is because it's illiquid. Okay, so what do I mean by that? By that I mean if you want to either put something in or put something out, uh, take something out, then you're going to have to pay a cost, right? So D here. Is deposits, D positive means you're depositing, D negative means you're withdrawing, so taking something out. If D is either positive or negative, not, so not equal to zero, you're gonna have to pay this cost chi here. Uh, I'll, show you, I'll show you what this looks like on the next slide, and that's gonna be obviously important. Okay, so um, the full model is a little bit more complicated. So there's two main things. So the, the first main thing is uh, that, that uh, there's some, there's a wedge between borrowing and saving rates in the liquid asset. So there's an RB minus and an RB plus if, if you want. Okay. Um, and the second thing, and so that's going to be actually important because it's going to give us that there's going to be a point mass of people um, with zero liquid wealth, which is something we see in the data and that's important. Okay. And the second thing is that uh, um, there's going to be some taxes and transfers just because we're interested in the fiscal response to monetary policies, as I've said in the introduction. Um, 
Okay, so let me briefly uh, uh, talk about uh, the adjustment cost function on the next slide. But just by the way, so th this is the most important slide of the of the presentation. So you know, if anything is unclear, uh, please do ask questions by all means. I haven't gotten any questions yet. Um, so, but if anything is unclear, please do ask questions. Okay. So here, this is just briefly about the adjustment cost function, um, the sky in the budget constraint. Um, the key takeaway from this slide here is that the adjustment cost function is kinked. Okay, it looks like the, the red line here. The key is that it has a kink uh, at zero. Uh, what does that mean? It means that, um, so on the, on the x-axis is uh, D basically, on the y-axis is chi. Um, it means that if you're at zero withdrawals or deposits, so D equals zero, and you're thinking about going to D equals epsilon, so just a little bit withdrawals or a little bit uh, deposits, um, then you're basically, your marginal cost is going to jump up discontinuously um, from zero to a strictly positive number. Okay, so that's what the kink does. Um, the main thing that does, okay, is generate some inaction. Okay, so there's going to be some people um, for whom their portfolio is not too out of whack and they're just going to decide to neither deposit nor withdraw. Okay, and indeed, so the blue thing here in the back, this histogram, is the histogram of deposits and withdrawals um, in the stationary distribution from our uh, numerical calibration later. Actually, you can see there's a big sp uh, spike at zero, right? And that's indeed exactly uh, the, the distribution of deposit or withdrawals. So there's a, uh, what's it here, between 25 and 30 percent of people that just never, with, uh, that don't uh, deposit or withdraw at a given point in time. Okay, so um, let me just go back. So I, I just want to emphasize again, is it, please do ask questions if this uh, setup here, this budget constraint isn't clear, because this is really the main thing to understand. And I think if you understand that, basically you're going to understand the whole model. So what you should think about basically is this, this the choices that an individual has, right? An individual here has two kind of key margins. Um, one is how much to consume and how, one is how much to save in liquid assets. So that's one margin. And the other mass, our mar margin is the portfolio choice between um, illiquid and liquid assets, okay? Um, and you should think about someone who's being hit by these Z shocks, these labor productivity shocks. And you should think about, you know, what they do in response to uh, uh, sort of over time, how do they adjust their portfolios? Okay, um, okay so uh, let me move on. Um, um, but again, do ask questions. So the, the uh, okay, there's a question. Yes, okay, that's a great question. Sorry, I should have said that. And um, so the question is, uh, uh, what are the constraints on B and A? So the constraint on B is that it's greater or equal to some number B min, which is negative. So B has to be greater or equal to say minus ten thousand dollars. Okay. Um, and as I've said, the the key thing is going to be um, there's going to be also in the full model a wedge in the interest rate between uh, negative and positive B. <clears throat> so there's going to be in the B region there's going to be two uh, key key points. One is there's a borrowing constraint at minus ten thousand dollars, and then there's this wedge in the interest rate at uh, at zero liquid wealth. <clears throat> On A, uh, the assumption is just going to be that A has to be greater or equal to zero. Um, uh, apart from that, there's no uh, so so you cannot borrow in the illiquid assets. Okay, um, does that? I hope that answers the question. Uh, okay, another question, another great question. Why does the cost depend on the stock of illiquid assets? So why does the chi here depend on A? Um, the answer is that, um, so we actually wrote it down uh, without it depending on A before. Uh, the problem you get is that, uh, and so it only depends on the level of D. The problem you get is that at some point, um, people become so rich in illiquid assets that they cannot withdraw uh, their money fast enough anymore, right? So if the cost only depends on the dollar amount you're withdrawing, uh, so just the level of D, then uh, if say, say you have like 
20 million dollars in liquid assets and then it would mean that if you want to withdraw a given percentage of that say 10 percent and the cost would be ginormous and you cannot withdraw it anymore instead the way we have it depend on a is basically the marginal cost just depends on the ratio of d over a so if you want to withdraw 10 percent um, from the uh, illiquid asset uh, account um, that's the same whether your illiquid asset account is a thousand dollars or a million dollars okay um, so this this assumption so there's a homogeneity assumption in this adjustment cost it's, by the way it's the totally standard assumption if you have uh, uh, capital adjustment costs people make this assumption too so the adjust, capital adjustment investment adjustment costs sorry don't depend on on the just on investment depend typically on the ratio of investment to capital right okay um, so I hope that answered that uh, one more um, so the answer to that question so the question is um, are B is specified as a function of B um, the, the only reason why in the paper are B is specified as a function of B is of, because of this wedge between borrowing and saving rates uh, here, right? So in particular, RB of B just means um, that it's one value if B is greater or equal to zero and another value if B is negative, okay? So if you, if you look further in the paper, it'll just say RB of B equals, then there's two cases, RB plus if B is positive and RB minus if B is negative. Um, the second part of the question is RA is not explicitly a function of any variable is RA exogenous? The answer is no. So both RA and, uh, and RB are endogenous and they're going to just be determined by market clearing conditions and that I'll show you later. Same for the wage. Okay, so the, the, so this this definitely is, and this is very important because otherwise you couldn't write the paper really, this definitely is a general equilibrium model in which case, uh, in, in which both RB or all of RB, RA and the wage W are determined in equilibrium. And I'll tell you how exactly in a second. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so the, the, this slide basically has more or less the remaining model ingredients. So in particular, this slide tells you, and, and this is exactly following up on the previous question, where uh, this RB and this RA come from, okay, how they're determined in equilibrium. Um, so first, let me talk about where the illiquid return comes from. That's the first bullet point. Um, so this one here. Um, so in particular, uh, we're going to assume that within the liquid acid A, um, the liquid acid itself consists of two types of liquid assets. One we're going to call productive capital, and the other one we're going to call equity. Okay. So now, why do we distinguish between them? It's mostly just a, a, an accounting uh, a construct. We, we call the productive capital, the capital that basically ends up in the production function, what we call equity is basically um, so claims to profit. So this is a, a, a model with sticky prices, in particular with uh, monopolistically competitive uh, producers. As a result, firms are going to make some profits, okay? Um, you got, and these profits are going to end up somewhere. Um, and so the way we set it up, and we thought that was the most natural, is you can basically be buy stocks that give you a claim to these profits. So you basically, basically you can buy shares in this tree. Um, we're going to call these shares S here at a price Q. Um, and if you buy these shares, uh, the, you, the tree, you, you're going to get some fruit from this tree. And the fruit from this tree are these profits pi um, of, the, of the intermediate goods producers. So then given you can costlessly sort of uh, reshuffle between the productive capital and the equity here, um, you're going to uh, have a, a no arbitrage condition, which says that the return on capital, um, the rental rate minus depreciation, um, so that's this thing here, right, and equals uh, the return on equity, that's this thing here, the return on equity is just uh, the, the dividends here, pi, plus um, asset price, um, uh, so capital gains, so Q dot over Q, um, and both of these um, equivalently then define the illiquid rate. So one thing you may ask is that, you know, why uh, can people cautiously reshuffle within the illiquid asset? Didn't you just tell me that it's an illiquid asset and you have to pay some costs for doing these transactions? Um, if you don't like that, one alternative assumption you can do is that the 
households deposit the illiquid asset in some intermediary, okay? And then the intermediary does this reshuffling. So for example, a pension fund, they can decide how to allocate your portfolio between uh, equity and this productive capital here. Um, uh, okay. <clears throat> so this is the asset side here. Um, so this is where the RA comes from, the illiquid asset side. Um, on the firm side, these firms are these monopolistically intermediate goods producers. Um, so basically, so, so this we're going to just take uh, again straight from the New Keynesian models. Um, they're going to rent illiquid capital and labor services from the household. Um, uh, and they're going to face some, some form of sticky prices. And we're going to go with a quadratic price adjustment costs as in this uh, Rotenberg paper. Um, not because we think this is a good model of sticky prices. I think it's a very bad model of sticky prices, but it's very, very convenient. And gives us nice close form solutions. And uh, our our focus is sort of on the household side of the economy, as I've said before. So that's why we wanted to do something simple here. Next generation of models, I think, something great to work on. Should probably combine rich models of uh, household savings and consumption behavior with uh, rich models of uh, sticky pricing. So for example, there's nice work by Fernando Alvarez and Francesco Lippi and these kind of guys. Okay, um, the government um, issues some liquid debt. Okay, that's uh, BG here. And it's gonna spend, there's gonna be some government spending G and there's gonna be some taxes and transfers. Um, uh, T, there should be also a little tau here, I guess. Um, so the, there's some lump sum transfers and then there's a distortive labor income tax. Finally, the monetary authority is going to be also completely standard. It's going to set the nominal rate on the liquid assets here, and it's going to operate a tail rule. So this is where the RB comes from. Okay. So just to uh, uh, follow up on Alberto uh, Ortiz's question from the chat again, so the RB here is endogenous but partly determined um, by what monetary policy does. The RA here is also endogenous, and it's uh, determined uh, by the thing on top, which is the uh, what happens in the illiquid asset market. In particular, it's going to be linked to the modern product of capital of the economy. So uh, let me move on, unless there's any questions. Um, so here's the market clearing conditions, and this is what pins down these RB and RA and W, so liquid and liquid return and wage. There's a liquid asset market clearing condition, which is, says the total household savings, so BH here, um, is just equal to um, the integral over all this little b, so all the household liquid assets, um, is basically equal. Um, so to to total household savings in liquid assets is equal to total government uh, debt, okay, minus BG. Um, so so the government takes the other side of whatever saving the household has. So the 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 government borrows from the household is another way of saying this. Um, the second equation is the illiquid asset market. So that equation just says that total amount of illiquid assets, A here, um, has to consist of either productive capital or this equity. Um, so productive capital here is K. Equity here is, um, there's a one a, a unit measure of stocks. So total S from the previous slide is equal to one. So therefore the total value of stocks is just equal to Q, the price of stocks. Okay, the second, uh, the third market clearing condition down here is the labor market clearing condition. That just says that the total labor demand N here by firms equal total labor supply. Uh, total labor supply here equals um, uh, uh, just the average or the, the aggregate over the total labor, over the labor supply by household. So that's L here. Um, and, and L here will generally depend on the household's individual state variables, which were which are illiquid wealth A, liquid wealth B, and uh, productivity or labor income Z. Um, and then you're gonna note, weight it by the labor income, right? And then there's you're integrating over this measure mu here, which is uh, the distribution, the joint distribution of A comma B comma Z. So it's a three-dimensional distribution here. And finally, goods market clearing condition is just whatever is implied by Walras law, really. Um, so forget about the, the last three terms for a second. Then it just says GDP Y equals consumption C plus investment I plus government spending G. So Y equals C plus I plus G. That should be familiar. And then there's three other terms. Those are really kind of small. Okay. Um, the, the first one is total transaction costs. So that's the chi. 
The second one is total theta is the, the price um, uh, uh, adjustment costs here. And the third thing is the borrowing costs, which are from this wedge between uh, borrowing and interest rates. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So just to think about how what 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 this economy looks like. So this economy. Um, um, so one uh, one second. I'll answer your question in a second. Um, so this economy really the key object to keep track of is um, this this. Uh, joint distribution mu here of a comma b comma z. So the reason why it's complicated is because you have this three-dimensional distribution um, over these heterogeneous guys, right? So there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity in the illiquid assets and the liquid assets and the labor productivity, and that's, we need to keep track of that object. And that's really the main challenge in, in, in uh, solving this method. Okay, so the question is, <clears throat> So I'm not sure I understand the question. So if you take equity away, this is a model with investment and capital adjustment costs. Um, I agree with that. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the question refers to. Let's see. Can you can you clarify? Otherwise, I'll uh, I'll just move on. Oh, I see. Uh, so why do we not uh, distribute equity as a lump sum? Yes. That's a that's a that's a great question actually. Um, the answer is that um, the the we wouldn't want to do this. Okay, so this is about this slide above here. Okay, so why do we? So what we choose to do instead is we have people buy um, these these stocks in equity that that give you a claim to equity. So why do we not just give the equity lump sum? So this is actually something that's uh, kind of a bit of a funny feature of the New Keynesian model. So the New Keynesian model has this feature that markups are countercyclical, okay, of these of these intermediate goods producers. Therefore, uh, profits are going to be typically counter uh, countercyclical, okay. So meaning that in a monetary expansion, profits are going to tank a lot, okay. Um, that means uh, that if we were to give this back household uh, lump sum to households, it would mean that uh, there would be some poor households whose main source of income is these profits, and they would be really, really hit very hard um, if in response to a monetary uh, expansion because their main income source is just going to plummet. Um, what we do instead is we, we have people buy these shares, um, this means that uh, basically the how much the profits are basically going to be roughly proportional to people's wealth, okay? Um, and this is going to be distributionally more neutral. So if you had lump sum distribution of equity um, um, or of, of these profits, then basically uh, uh, you would get these very big redistributional effects, and that would actually be kind of a problem. Okay, I hope that answered. It. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so let me briefly talk about the solution method because um, I think we're doing fine on time. Um, uh, this is a bit of an interlude. Okay. So uh, this is uh, uh, so as I said, the, the key difficulty here, right, is having to keep track of this joint distribution of liquid assets, illiquid assets, and income. So a comma b comma z, which is this very complicated infinite dimensional object. Uh, so the way we solve this is in, in using some continuous time method I've uh, developed with some other people. Um, and here's basically roughly how this works. So the key idea here is that in order to solve a heterogeneous agent model, you can set it up a solving system of partial differential equations. Okay? Um, the first equation is going to be uh, what's called the hamilton jacob bellman equation, so just a continuous time Bellman equation for uh, the individual choices of, of this continuum of guys. The second equation is uh, what's called the Kolmogorov forward equation, which is basically just the law of motion for a distribution that summarizes this evolution of this distribution. Okay. The complication is that these equations are going to be coupled. Right? The way it's going to work is the hamilton jackie bellman equation, the first equation tells you, given prices, uh, what are the optimal policy functions of people? And the second equation tells you then, given the optimal policy function, what's the distribution? From that, you can kind of update prices, and then you kind of have to fix, find a fixed point 
um, in these two equations. Yeah. That being said, what's kind of nice is that there's uh, uh, many well-developed methods for analyzing and solving uh, these types of equations. One that I like and use is uh, what we call these, uh, what's called the finite difference method. Um, and there's a lot of example codes on my website for solving this kind of model. Uh, one thing just for advertisements, this apparatus is actually very general, way more general than solving this type of model I just showed you. And it really applies to any heterogeneous Asian model um, with a continuum of atomistic agent. So one example would be heterogeneous households, like the model I'm showing you. Um, but you can also use this to solve models with heterogeneous firms, like a Hoppenheim model, or you could have both heterogeneous households or heterogeneous firms, and so on. And the method can be sort of extended to handle aggregate shocks, uh, um, like like what I, uh, um, which which well, I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Okay, yeah. Well, oh, sorry. One thing I should have said um, in the present paper that we have uh, so far. Um, we're not going to have proper aggregate shocks, so, so we're going to do, uh, I'm going to show you later impulse responses to monetary policy shocks, but we're going to do basically uh, not proper aggregate shocks. Instead, we're going to do um, what, uh, so, so I'm a Chicago PhD, we used to always call this MIT shocks, okay? So the idea is sort of, you sit in a steady state, then there's a zero probability event, um, some shock hits, um, and then, uh, so you don't see it coming, so you don't take it into account at all, you don't form expectations over it, and then after uh, the shock hit, everything mean reverts deterministically over time. So for this paper here, we do these MIT shocks, um, and now uh, I know how to handle aggregate shocks as well, I'll talk about it in a second. Um, we, we could have done that too, and it looks kind of similar. Okay, um, <clears throat> just very briefly, um, so because people ask me this frequently, um, so why why solve it in continuous time? What what, what are the advantages of doing that? Um, here's kind of four advantages I like to uh, emphasize. Um, so the first thing is con continuous time is very convenient if you have uh, boring constraints. Okay, and in particular boring constraints, um, rather than showing up in first order conditions as inequalities, only show up in boundary conditions. Okay. And uh, you should look at this uh, uh, paper here with Ashdu, Han, and Lasri, uh, and Leon to look at that. But basically, the, the, the key thing is that first order conditions kind of always hold with equality and continuous time. The, the intuition a little bit is like, if you're strictly above the boring constraint, say B, uh, the boring constraint rate would be B greater or equal to minus $10,000. If you're strictly above the boring constraint, then in a tiny interval of time, um, you're not going to go all the way to the boring constraint. Okay. So therefore, uh, uh, you can sort of forget about the boring constraint uh, when you write down the HGB equation, uh, and and, uh, and 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 it doesn't affect the first order condition. Which is not to say that the boring constraint doesn't matter. In fact, it's going to matter a lot. Um, but just just to be clear about this, the second thing is uh, kind of related to this. Um, first order conditions are, are very simple. In particular, they tend to be static. Um, so in discrete time for people who notice a typical first order condition will be marginal utility of consumption equals a beta discount factor times marginal value of wealth tomorrow, okay? Um, here there is no tomorrow, so tomorrow is today, um, and therefore uh, you, you basically just get marginal utility of consumption equals marginal value of wealth today. Given a guess for a value function, this marginal value of wealth here, this VB here, I'm, I'm talking about this thing here, it's just a number, so therefore you can usually say uh, solve first order conditions by hand. The third thing, this is really where the main speed gains come from, is what I call sparsity here. Uh, so the key thing here is that solving uh, Bellman equation or distribution really doesn't look that different from what you do in, in, in discrete time for people who've worked with this. In particular, it's going to turn out that you want to uh, kind of uh, typically invert a bunch of matrices. So for example, when you solve a Bellman equation, right, you guess a vector, you discretize the state space, you guess uh, a vector for the for the value function and you iterate on it somehow, and at each iteration you're gonna have to invert a matrix. Um, the nice thing here is that these matrices are gonna be very sparse. More precisely, they're gonna be typically what's called tridiagonal. A tridiagonal matrix is one that has zeros everywhere, except on the diagonal, one to the right and one to the left. Um, so, so that's the kind of matrix that's going to arise. The intuition is that these matrices are really kind of the transition matrix of the stochastic process here. Um, and 
as long as we have continuously moving state variables like here, liquid and illiquid wealth, um, you will get this triadic diagonal feature. In particular, um, in a small interval of time on a discretized state space, you're going to either stay where you are or you're going to go one step to the right or one step to the left. So that's where the triadiagonal comes from. And then MATLAB basically is very, very good at solving uh, sparse linear systems. So that's, that's what that does. The final thing is, um, I don't want to dwell, delve into this too much. You basically, after having solved the Bellman equation, you kind of get the, 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 the distribution for free. And there's a sort of a technical thing, which is that the, the matrix in the discretized Komarov forward equation, so this law of motion for the distribution is kind of just a transpose of the discretized HGB equation. So one is sort of the transpose problem of the other, and that's kind of convenient. Okay, just briefly about these aggregate shocks. So um, for people who want to kind of get their hands dirty and play around with this a bit, um, they, they, they may want to check this out. So um, the paper I've just talked about um, kind of had idiosyncratic shocks only, a, a method for handling models with idiosyncratic shocks only, but not aggregate shocks. Um, as I've said, this is also what we do in this paper. We only have these MIT shocks. Um, but now we actually know how to handle proper aggregate shocks. Uh, as is well known, this is a much harder problem. In particular, right, uh, you, you get that you have to carry around the distribution as a state variable in the Bellman equation of the households. Um, I have this paper with uh, uh, Seyun, um, Ahn here, uh, Greg Kaplan, Tom Winberry, and Christian Wolf where we kind of de develop a computational method, which is basically an extension of the previous method to also focus, to also handle aggregate shocks. Um, we actually have an open source MATLAB toolbox online now, um, uh, which you can find on my website and this GitHub link here to solve these kind of models. Um, just briefly, it's sort of an extension of a standard linearization method. The idea comes from this uh, paper by Jeff Campbell and Michael Ryder. Um, where you linearize with respect to aggregate state variables only, okay? So not with respect to idiosyncratic state variables. That's very important because you want to uh, retain that, that non-linearity. Non -linearity. So there are different slopes at each point in the state space. Um, okay, so you can actually go online, go, go to this GitHub website, and there's basically like a, a one-asset Hank model on there. So not the two-asset one, like, like the complicated or rich one that we have here, but the one asset one, which is simple, and you can actually play around with this. It takes like half a second or a second to solve, I think, and you can uh, see, look at some impulse responses if you want. Okay, so let me move on, unless there's any other questions on this, and go back to the, the main paper, um, uh, and in particular tell you how we take this model I've showed you um, with these liquid and liquid assets and these sticky prices, how we take that to the data. <coughs> There's basically, I would say, uh, uh, so there's a lot of things about the parameterization. It's a big model, as you may have seen, uh, with a lot of parameters. I'm not going to tell you about how we choose every single one of them. I'm going to instead focus on explaining how we choose a bunch of, we make a bunch of choices that are kind of particularly sort of important and also kind of unique to our problem that we're studying. Okay, one second. So the first obvious one is how to uh, you know, take the model which has these two types of assets, uh, liquid and illiquid, to the data. Um, and the difficulty being, of course, that in the data there's not just two types of assets. There's all sorts of different assets, and they differ um, not just whether they're liquid or liquid, but they also differ in all sorts of other things. And furthermore, liquid and illiquid is not just a binary thing, right? It's kind of continuous. So um, here's what we did. So we went to uh, the, the flow of funds um, uh, from the US Federal Reserve. Um, and we uh, just went, so the, the flow of funds, um, there's, a, there's a part that's sort of, you can think of the, as the aggregate household balance sheet of US households, okay? And so we basically just went through line item by line item, and we went through different assets, and we made different judgment calls on whether we call them liquid or liquid. So the first one that's easy, for example, liquid assets, the big things are, so this is not everything here, this is, these are the big things. The big liquid assets here are cash, bank accounts, and government and corporate bonds. Uh, the big illiquid assets here um, are equity, I'll come back to that in a second, and housing. Housing is really 
the biggest item here uh, in the in the flow of funds out of any asset class uh, for U.S. households. Okay, um, so one thing you you may think about or raise, um, and one thing I wanted to flag, and one thing that we're maybe not super proud of is that we here call all equity um, illiquid. Okay, in particular, um, for those some of you may hold some stocks, you know. Uh, if you, maybe I don't know uh, what kind of platforms exist in the US there's for example you can have these Vanguard trading accounts um, and that seems like pretty liquid right you can just go online and tr trade and withdraw some and, and buy and sell some bonds uh, some stocks sorry as you go along so why do we call them illiquid um, the answer is I think the, the right way to think about it would be really to split equity into two types of equity the first one would be uh, what you would call um, directly held equity and the second one is what's indirectly held equity directly held equity being what's in your personal trading account your Vanguard account and indirectly held equity being uh, for example in particular what's in your retirement account okay turns out that in the US indirectly held equity is uh, quite a lot bigger than directly held equity um, so that's why I'm not so worried about but I think it would be for future work it would be nicer to have two types of equity in the model um, uh, directly held and indirectly held and, and make this distinction we didn't want to introduce another asset because that's already kind of uh, complicated the model okay um the the second thing here is uh this income process so the z in the model um and here's how this works so we uh we we uh, i've already said this incorporate this sort of new evidence that these uh, income changes that we see in the data don't look normally distributed, right? So they, what, what these guys, Gruven and Karen, Oscar and Song do, is they just look in the data, they have administrative data from the US Social Security Administration. They look in the data at the histogram of uh, income changes, okay? Um, from one year to the next, uh, just labor income changes, I guess. And they find that, uh, so typically what we put in our model is something that's normally distributed. They find that basically what's in the data uh, looks nothing like that. Instead, this has fat tails, and uh, and and for a lot of people, basically their income doesn't change for one from one year to the next. I think the right interpretation, you know, is that uh, the basic income changes are either small if you stay at the same job, um, maybe you get a bonus or something, but it's not going to change too much, or they're going to be large if you switch jobs or you become unemployed, you get a promotion and so on. Okay. Uh, we incorporate this. I don't want to talk about it too much, um, but uh, it, it's just to, to flag this actually matters and helps us. So basically, these households face a lot of risk. This helps us get uh, the household portfolios right here. Okay. Um, the third thing that's kind of important, obviously, is um, how to calibrate or parameterize this adjustment cost function and the discount rate. Um, so you can see, uh, so, so this, this kinked function from before, right? This chi function. Um, I'll talk about it on the next slide. So what we basically do is we calibrate these parameters to match some important things about the uh, um, wealth distribution, in particular um, the the total amount of liquid and liquid wealth, and and this is a really important thing, the fraction of what we call hand-to-mouth households here, HDM, um, which are which we define as households with uh, zero liquid wealth. I'll talk about it on the next slide. Finally, on the production side. Um, we're going to really follow uh, a standard calibration of a new Keynesian model. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, the Phillips curve parameters and so on, we're going to take them there. Um, in terms of preferences, we're going to have standard several preferences um, here with a, a intertemporal elasticity of substitution of one, so log utility, and also fresh labor supply elasticity of one, uh, so this quadratic utility here. Um, People who may have seen earlier versions of this paper, may, maybe no one. We at some point we had GHH preferences um, uh, bec because those help a bit with with income effects at the micro level. Um, but then people kind of complained said we're not comparing apples with apples when we compare it to the rep representative Asian Yukonji model, so we switched to representative uh, to, to separate preferences. Okay. So let's hope you can see this. Um, this is uh, one key slide which shows that the model basically matches key features of the U.S. wealth distribution. <clears throat> so let's forget about the graphs for a second and focus on the on the table at the bottom. Um, so 
this basically shows some key aspects of our calibration. Um, so on the left, the red column here is the is the data, and the blue here uh, is is the model. Okay. Um, as you can see, so two of the moments we we target um, are just the total amount of illiquid assets and the total amount of liquid assets relative to GDP. So why do we do this? Um, we think you know this is a macro paper. I think any macro paper, any serious macro modeling of the household side should be consistent with at least uh, the total, the, the wealth totals in the U.S. economy. So you want something like between three and four uh, uh, wealths of of GDP. For emerging markets, these would, for example, look different, I guess. Um, the second thing um, we we kind of tried our our calibration tries to match is these two li line items here at the bottom. So the poor hand to mouth and the wealthy hand to mouth. Um, and uh, the definition that we use here is we call poor hand to mouth people that have neither liquid wealth nor illiquid wealth. Okay. And we call wealthy hand to mouth people that have no liquid wealth, uh, but that may have positive or even substantial illiquid wealth. Okay. Uh, if you look at the survey of consumer finances, you find that. Um, about 10% of people are poor hand to mouth, so they have neither liquid nor liquid wealth, and about 20% of people are wealthy hand to mouth, so they have neither. So they ha so they don't have liquid wealth. Sorry, but they do have potentially quite a lot of illiquid wealth. Okay, um, and this is really you know the key thing that our the whole model, like with the adjustment cost function with the kink, and uh, and and this wedge between borrowing and savings rates. Uh, and and the, the like the so the whole two asset structure really and the amount of risk is all really um, sort of backward engineered if you want um, to get uh, this in the model, namely that there's 30% of people um, that look like they're kind of constrained. Okay, that are these hand to mouth guys. Okay, just just to be clear. And please ask questions if this isn't clear. So the, really, all the complicated apparatus is just to get that because these guys are going to be up to this constraint. Okay, um, let me briefly talk about the graphs on the top. So the graphs on the top show you the distribution of liquid wealth and that of illiquid wealth, and that comes out of the model. In the paper, we also have the, compar the comparison to what's in the data. Um, so in particular, we have the Lorentz curves from the survey of consumer finances, um, and, and it shows that the model kind of does well. The, the key thing to take away here is that um, the model generates a lot of dispersion in liquid and illiquid wealth. In particular, it generates something we see in data, which is are these these uh, distributions are both extremely skewed. So um, you know, just look at the illiquid wealth distribution, for example. Um, our model, and in particular, look at the axes here. Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this graph here. Um, you can see the so the, the axis here is in million of dollars. So, so you can see that in our model, there's Substantial amount of people and that actually have, say, uh, illiquid wealth of twenty million dollars. Okay, um, and uh, and um, and uh, and 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 that's kind of we're, we're kind of happy about that because models are, don't typically do very well in that. Also, liquid wealth here is quite dispersed on the left, and you can see um, that there's twenty nine percent of people. So that's the number here from the from the table at the bottom are at zero liquid wealth. Um, so Francisco is asking a good question, which is, will monetary policy affect the distribution of wealth? Um, turns out the answer is uh, not that much, a little bit, but not that much. The answer, so, so the, the reason for that is that wealth distributions in these kind of models are typically a, a quite slow moving object. The only thing that really moves fast is asset price changes. They're going to be not that big in our model. We can talk about that later. Um, but but apart from asset price changes, the wealth distribution doesn't move very fast. Um, what does uh, get uh, affected a lot, in answer to Francisco's question again, is not the distribution of wealth, but the distribution of um, capital income. Okay, the income you get from that wealth. Um, in particular, I'll talk about this at length more. So suppose some people with Positive amounts of liquid we wealth, uh, Francisco, right, are going to uh, be very differently affected by an interest rate cut by monetary policy 
than people with negative amounts of liquid wealth, right? For one, if you if you have negative if you have negative liquid wealth, an interest rate cut is great because you have to pay less interest on your debt. If you have positive liquid wealth, a uh, liquid wealth, say you're um, one of these guys out here with like seven hundred thousand um, dollars, and here are these guys, oops, seven hundred thousand dollars. You're really not gonna like it um, if monetary policy cuts these liquid rates uh, uh, because uh, you know that that just wipes out a big chunk of your income probably. Um, so Alberto's question I interpret as saying, um, does monetary policy affect labor taxes? Um, and the answer is yes, uh, depending on the uh, on the uh, on the fiscal policy scenario we're in, so we we're not going to take a stand. I've, t I've told you in response to monetary policy uh, change, the uh, fiscal policy necessarily has to respond in some way, right? And we're going to just explore different scenarios. We're not going to. Oh, I see. Sorry, that's the question. How does taxation in general change uh, the income and wealth distribution? Um, yes, I have for sure. Uh, taxation does change uh, the income and wealth distribution quite a lot. Again, I mean, there would be a question about the the time frame. Um, so, 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 so the income distribution will be affected straight away, and particularly the after tax income distribution, also the pre tax income distribution, because it's going to affect uh, labor supply, I guess. Um, although not all that much, I think. Um, for the wealth distribution, there is a question um, how that's going to be affected. I think it depends whether you look in the short run or sort of in the long run. In the long run, I think if you change, say, um, the, the, the labor income tax rate, um, which I think in our current model is 25%, say you uh, increase that to 30%, um, I'm relatively sure you would go to a steady state. Um, where there would be uh, uh, less wealth in the long run and there would be less inequality um, uh, as well. Okay. Hope that answered it. Uh, let me move on then. Um, so, one, uh, we do one other before before we sort of go um, to, to, to the full exercise I want to show you. I wanted to show you one other sort of warm up exercise. Um, the warm up exercise we do. Um, oh, I see. So let me follow up on this again. So Alberto is asking, could you do counterfactuals to provide answers to some of Piketty's ideas? Um, I see. So you want to change the, say you want to put in the wealth tax and see what happens. Um, yes, I mean I think you can for sure uh, use this kind of model. Uh, to look at that, I mean, we haven't really done that as part of this paper, obviously, because it's kind of a a, a totally different question. Um, but I I'm very sympathetic in the sense that you know you want to have a model that takes household balance sheets seriously. You probably don't want to just have a one asset model if you want to take these Piketty ideas seriously and ex explore them. Um, uh, instead, you'd probably want to have, say, distinguish between housing and what's in your checking account. Um, I haven't, you know, tried out what happens if you if you do this. Um, yeah, I, I I mean I could speculate a bit, but I mean it would be, yeah, I I don't think I'd want to do that without having done the exercise. Uh, but for sure, I do think the framework is kind of suited in in that sense. Well, one one thing. So sorry. One one thing actually I should uh, I I, th I should mention is that one thing actually our model does, and this this is actually kind of important if you wanted to do an exercise like this. I do think one thing that our exercise our our model does kind of miss a little bit is the very very top of the wealth distribution. Okay, so the top one percent wealth share um, in our model is too low. Relative to the data, in particular in in liquid wealth, illiquid wealth is actually kind of fine, but for liquid wealth, it's too low. So there's a table in the paper where you can see this, and this is just sort of a a, a feature of these Iagari type models uh, in general. If you only rely on labor income risk, 
um, as the only thing that uh, drives dispersion in wealth, um, you're going to have a trouble getting the very top tail of the wealth distribution, right? In particular, in the data, the wealth distribution has a Pareto tail. This model doesn't. Okay. There's nice work by uh, Jess Benabit and Alberto Bizin that argue that if you introduce capital income risk on, to on top of labor income risk, then you can get these uh, Pareto tails uh, very nicely. And so the, if you'd wanted to do the Piketty thing, you'd probably want to introduce capital income risk in this model on top of that uh, and uh, to, to really get the top one and top 0.1% wealth distribution, right? Okay, so back to uh, uh, the, the main exercise here. So the, the model here, um, uh, so, so, so before going to the main results, I wanted to show you one other main uh, exercise, which is that we just went to the stationary equilibrium of our economy, okay? And we uh, basically give every person a $500 check, and then we see what happens. In particular, the question is, how high or low are marginal propensities to consume out of this $500 check that we give them. Um, why do we do this exercise? We do this exercise because uh, the numbers here are easy to compare to some existing empirical evidence. In particular, there's some nice papers um, by, say, Johnson Parker and Sulelis and, and, and so on. I'll show you another nice empirical paper in a second um, that study um, MPCs out of transitory um, windfall info income gains. The numbers they get is that sort of over a quarter um, out of $500, people typically consume like something like 20%. Um, in, instead, uh, over a, a year, for example, and this will be roughly like, uh, this will obviously be much more like say four times 16% or something like that, uh, right? So it'll, it'll get towards uh, sort of uh, about 50% on average over, over, uh, over a year. Um, over a quarter is sixteen percent. So here's what this looks like in the in the in the model. So the first thing is here on the number on the bottom. Okay, um, the MPC that we get in our model here is sixteen uh, percent on average over a quarter um, out of this five hundred dollar windfall. Again, over a year, this is obviously higher. So this gets quite close uh, to what the empirical literature finds. Um, more interestingly to us is that this aggregate number actually. Uh, masks a lot of heterogeneity, okay? Um, in particular, this is what this graph here shows. So this graph here shows that, what, so what, what is this graph? So this graph here has liquid wealth on, the, on this axis, it has illiquid wealth on this axis, and on this axis then it shows the quarterly MPC here, okay? Um, and what you can see is that there's sort of two regions in the state space where these uh, quarterly MPCs are high, okay? The first one is there's these two ridges. The first ridge is this ridge like down here, okay? And the second ridge is this ridge up here, okay? So the first ridge is uh, the, the first ridge in the bottom, um, that's the people who are up against the boring constraint. I said this, so there's a little bit more than minus $10,000 on the liquid wealth axis. Um, that actually doesn't matter all that much because there aren't that many people there. More importantly, is the ridge on top that I just currently pointing the arrow to, uh, the arrow to, okay? Um, and uh, the, the key thing here is that these, so these are people with zero liquid wealth, okay? These are people who are at this kink in the borrowing constraint between borrowing and lending rates, okay? And uh, the, the key thing here is that um, the, these guys have high MPCs even if they have a lot of illiquid wealth, right? So you can see here, on, on this axis, so some of these guys will have like three or four hundred thousand dollars of illiquid wealth, uh, but as long as they have zero liquid wealth, they're going to have high MPCs. Okay, this is uh, something that Greg and Gianluca in their previous work have called uh, the wealthy hand to mouth. Okay, where the idea is that there's some people they're wealthy on paper, um, but they may behave as if they're poor. Okay, um, so so. You know, and, and, and they've argued that this is important for fiscal policy. We're kind of arguing that they're important for monetary policy as well. So just briefly, um, to put a picture in your head, so who are these guys? So what you should think about is, a, is, is someone who had sort of a, a nice, cushy job. So starts out with no liquid wealth and no liquid wealth, say graduates from college, and gets a nice, cushy job with a high labor income, so a high Z, right? So then what this guy is going to do is he's going to first 
um, accumulate some liquid wealth, some B. Okay, it's going to accumulate some liquid wealth. At some point, he's going to say, ah, okay, um, I kind of have a lot of liquid wealth. I don't really need all this liquid wealth. I'm going to buy, buy a house. Okay, so he goes and buys a house. So he, he switches some of his liquid wealth to illiquid wealth. Um, after a while then, uh, uh, say this, this guy loses his job. This is just an example, right? So suppose this guy loses his job. So what's the guy going to do? And now comes the key thing. The guy is going to first draw down his liquid wealth. Okay, at some point he's going to reach zero liquid wealth. Okay, um, but the key thing is here, what's he going to do once he reaches zero liquid wealth? In particular, is he going to immediately sort of sell and liquidate this house? Okay, the answer is no. Why? Because there's a fixed cost for selling the house. And so what he wants to do is he wants to wait around and see a bit and hopes he's going to find a job in the meantime before he sells his house. Okay. Um, obviously, ultimately, he's going to uh, sell his house, but uh, at least for a while, there's going to be some guys who, say, have a big house, so a lot of uh, illiquid wealth um, and zero liquid wealth, and they're going to basically behave as if they're poor, even though they're rich. So this is exactly these guys who are up kind of on this ridge here. Okay, And this is kind of the whole model is basically designed to get these guys. Okay, So let me move on. Um, so just to tell you that this is empirically kind of actually reasonable, here's a nice uh, uh, paper from uh, from empirical uh, evidence from Norway. So there's two great things about Norway. Um, the first great thing is that um, they have a wealth tax. Okay. Um, so why do I say that's great? Not because I sort of uh, necessarily support the wealth tax. It's mostly just great for economists because then you have administrative data on people's wealth. Okay. Um, the second thing is uh, the Norwegians really like playing the lottery. Okay. And you have to declare your lottery earnings on your income tax returns. So what these guys, Fagerang, Holm, and Natvik here do is they study um, NPCs out of lottery winnings and then they look at them um, as a function of people's liquid and illiquid wealth. Okay. The key thing to think about is the graph on the left, okay, so this one, um, and the axes are kind of the same as on the previous graph, a little bit different, the, the illiquid asset axis is reversed. The key thing they find is that the people with the highest NPCs are exactly the people with no liquid assets, and in particular, even if they have uh, high illiquid assets here, so these are quartiles, so even in this bin here, these are people with a lot of illiquid assets, but no liquid assets. Do they have high NPCs? Okay. Okay. So let me uh, go to the main results, show you the main um, exercises we've done. Um, so sorry. So, so just to be clear, so this was just to say that this graph kind of is consistent with something we see in the data. Okay. Let's go to the main results. Um, so the the main thing I'm going to show you is. Uh, the transmission of a, a monetary policy shock. We're going to basically follow the standard textbook exercise that people do. So we're just going to do the response of the economy to an expansionary monetary policy shock, meaning an innovation here, epsilon, a negative innovation to the Taylor rule. We're going to assume that the central bank operates a Taylor rule here that looks like this. So nominal interest rate equals some intercept plus some coefficient phi times inflation plus uh, this monetary policy error or, or innovation. Um, note this Taylor rule has no uh, uh, term for the output gap. You could uh, put that in, it makes zero difference. So we wanted to keep it simple. So we have the Taylor rule only responding to inflation. All experiments I'm going to do, I'm going to show you um, a drop in this epsilon, so a monetary policy innovation of negative 25 basis points. Mean per quarter, uh, meaning 1% at an annualized level. So monetary expansion, monetary interest rate cut by 1% per year. Okay. Uh, so here's the here's the, the 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 main type of graphs I'm going to show you. So on the left here is basically the red line is the shock we're feeding in, um, and the graphs I'm going to show you is always quarters on the x-axis and deviations from steady state on the on the y-axis. So the red line is the shock we're feeding in, and the blue line is uh, what happens to the liquid, the real liquid return here 
um, in response to the to the to the monetary expansion. So as a standard in this model, uh, in these models, in response to this expansionary monetary policy shock, the liquid re return drops, right, and uh, inflation rises. Okay. Um, this then results in the thing on the right hand side. So these are the main uh, uh, macroeconomic aggregates people to be care about. So output Y, consumption C, investment I, and you can see that um, here investment rises by more uh, than than output, which in turn rises by more than consumption um, in response to this monetary policy shock. Um, so that's sort of qualitatively consistent with the data. So it's kind of good um, for people who are familiar. Um, with the literature on vector autoregression evidence on uh, economies response to monetary policy shocks uh, you will see that uh, one thing that our graphs do not have is what one thing you see typically in this literature which is sort of hump shaped impulse responses but I'm, I'm talking about these variables here um, in the data they're typically kind of hump shaped um, so they reach the peak only after like a few quarters um, we're not going to we're never going to get that our model doesn't have anything like uh, habit formation um, and so on uh, or, or investment adjustment costs so so we're, we're and we're not even going to try and we're happy with this okay so now comes kind of the first main result um, and which is this decomposition so what we're going to do is we're going to basically go to the previous slide and we're going to focus on the blue line for consumption we're going to forget about output and investment we're just focused on the blue line and uh, we're going to think about uh, how where this transmission comes from okay so uh, here's how this is going to work and this is kind of the ma main the key first key the first key result and this uh, decomposition into direct and indirect effects so uh, the, the key, so here's the math, um, but let me say it in words kind of first. Okay. The key thing to think about is that the only thing that really matters about the macroeconomy from the point of view of households is what happens to prices in the economy and what fiscal policy does. So in particular, prices here are RB, RA, and W. In fiscal policy, um, there can be potentially lump sum transfer, um, but, but maybe also not. Okay, I'm going to show you different scenarios. In the baseline scenario, I'm going to have Lump sum transfers moving in response to a, a monetary expansion it doesn't have to be the case. All the results kind of go through, um, even if you if you have uh, no lump sum transfers moving. Um, in fact, th there's a bit of a difference with the, which we think is interesting. So that was this thing about the fiscal response. Um, so the key thing to think about is that the thing that matters for households is the the prices. Okay. Now. Uh, these prices and, and fiscal policy, they move in equilibrium somehow. So if you feed in the equilibrium price changes into the household's problem, you're uh, obviously going to get back just the time path of aggregate consumption um, uh, uh, that, that you're also going to get in equilibrium. Uh, so what we're, gonna, what we're going to do is we're not going to do that. We're not going to feed in all the price changes um, into the household's problem simultaneously. Instead, we're going to kind of feed them in one by one. Okay, so we're going to take the the say the equilibrium um, time path of interest rates, so the RB here, which is the blue dashed line here on the left. Okay, this thing, uh, the the blue dashed line here, and we're going to um, feed that in into the households problem, um, and uh, we're going to assume that all the other prices. Uh, they remain fixed at the steady state, okay? And then we're going to kind of just compute um, uh, what would have happened to aggregate consumption if only the liquid return would have changed, okay, say, and then we're going to call that direct effect. So that's this term here. Then we're going to repeat this exercise and we're going to say what would have happened to aggregate consumption if only the liquid return would have changed. That would have, uh, this, we're going to call that indirect effects due to liquid return. Same for wages and same for tax policy. Okay, so here here comes so this the main result. So uh, the 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 black line here uh, is the total response. So that's just uh, from the previous slide again. Okay, this is, the black line is the same as the dashed blue line on the previous slide. Uh, total response of consumption to the interest rate changes. The blue line now is um, what would have happened to aggregate consumption if only the liquid return would have changed. 
Um, and the answer is basically you can see it. Um, the total response of consumption would have been way smaller. In particular, it would have only been say like a third on impact of the overall response. Or if you integrate over say four quarters or a year, it's actually even less uh, than a third. Um, and now the key thing. So the blue line is way below the black line. Okay. So the key thing to think about is what would this graph have looked like in a representative agent you can model, so in a rank model, okay? And the key is that the blue line would have basically been right on top of the black line, okay? Because these direct effects basically account for kind of 95% of the of the overall response. Here in Stamp, they uh, account for less than a third, okay? So basically, once you understand that, and you basically understood the main result or the first main result and 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 and, and so you kind of understood everything there's a little bit of a question where does the, rem the difference between the blue and the black line come from right so let me tell you that so i'll just show you the whole thing so this basically breaks it down into um these these other responses so, so the key one to look at is basically the the one the main one that's important is this one here the red dashed line here which is how uh, households respond to income changes okay and um, that's the one that's quantitatively most important so just because households have high NPCs they're going to respond to income changes a lot um, and and so that that plays uh, an important role and in fact these indirect effects due to income changes here are more important than the indi indirect effects due to interest rate changes um, one thing to note here as well so this is I, I kind of said this briefly um, this is for the baseline scenario where the government's fiscal policy also responds uh, to interest rate changes. Um, therefore, you also get this line here, indirect T, this one. Okay. Ooh, sorry. Um, this line, so the dashed red line, that also gives you a bit of action. This one. Um, and, uh, you know, so this whether this line is there basically just depends on what the government does. Um, we in the paper we have different scenarios as well. I'll show you one in a second. So if, if if the government basically just saves whatever windfall it has from lower interest rates, then you don't get that line. But it's still true. You can see it kind of here that the that the effect of income changes is larger than the effect of interest rate changes. Thank you. Um, so this is the main thing. So again, ask questions if anything is unclear. Um, and, and let me move on. Okay. Okay. Here's uh, one graph that I kind of like. It kind of shows uh, the the effects of monetary policy across the liquid wealth distribution. Um, so on the x-axis is liquid wealth. On the y-axis is this consumption elasticity um, to this uh, liquid wealth change uh, to the interest rate changes. We again break it down into um, uh, these direct effects and these indirect effects. Okay. Now uh, the blue lines again the direct effects. The red line are the combined indirect effects. The histogram in the back is actually the consumption shares of these different uh, uh, liquid wealth uh, types. So th the idea is that if you integrate the blue line against the histogram you get back the total uh, direct effect from the previous slide so 18 percent or whatever it was um, and if you integrate the red line you get back the direct the total indirect effect from the previous slide as well so that was 80 percent or something um, you can see there's two regions in the state space that are kind of special um, so the, the main one being again this B equals zero region, where um, just the indirect effect and the direct effects look very different. So in particular, people with zero liquid wealth, they're just constrained. Um, they don't respond to interest rate changes. They do respond to, uh, to income changes. So the indirect effects are quite large there. So you have the spike. Um, the, the blue line then, let's think about the blue line briefly. So you can see the blue line kind of increases as you go from zero to positive liquid wealth it increases kind of from zero and at the end it's kind of roughly below two so this number two here is kind of important because that's exactly what it would be 
in a represented agent Newcanian model um, where people basically these direct effects so the total effects here are such that the total effects are two and the direct effects are basically 95 percent of the of the total effect so that would be exactly what this blue line is here so the 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 rich liquid rich guys they pay, behave exactly like uh like a permanent income consumer not surprisingly as they should okay um let me think what else to show you briefly okay this is something kind of interesting so one okay one thing to think about is that there's still a region where there's actually a lot of people right here kind of um so between say zero and forty thousand uh dollars of liquid wealth and there's a lot of consumption accounted for by these guys um that have low direct effects okay uh, so the question is why are these direct effects so low even though these guys are kind of not constrained right i mean they're 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 they do have positive liquid wealth so why don't they respond to interest rate changes more strongly okay and the answer is kind of on the next slide here so again it's about these kind of people here um there's kind of a bunch of different effects so interest rate change here has sort of offsetting income and substitution effects um so in particular uh these these guys uh they they're they're so the substitution effects are still basically just kind of small and the reason is basically that they there's two reasons so the first one is they face some risk of running into the constraint in the future the other thing is that's exactly like why uh, we we emphasize these uh these two types of assets and why we think it's important there's actually something going on that we call a portfolio reallocation channel okay um in particular um, people with uh low liquid wealth here um or, or in this region there they're not constrained but when the return on liquid wealth falls it turns out the return on illiquid wealth doesn't fall as much what they're going to do is they're basically going to um they're going to reallocate their portfolio toward the illiquid assets so in a so in a one asset model you basically just have one margin either you save or you consume so if you save less you necessarily consume more here you kind of have these two margins so if you save less in the liquid in the liquid asset doesn't necessarily mean that you consume more it can also just mean that you put some of your money in the illiquid assets and that's exactly what happened okay oops sorry so uh this is just uh let me skip this this is just about the fiscal policy i've kind of already said this so the overall is, uh, um, effectiveness here depends quite a lot on the fiscal policy okay that shouldn't be too surprising so basically if fiscal policy gives a uh, uh, response to in, to an expansionary monetary policy by cutting taxes you get an extra impulse but note that um, and this is this number sort of up here Note that even if um, fiscal policy doesn't give these transfers, so it just saves, um, uh, you do still get uh, that the direct effects um, are less than half of the total effects. So sometimes people have this misconception that's all that's going on in our model is sort of fiscal policy uh, masking as monetary policy, but it's not true, just to be clear. Okay, there's something else uh, that I don't really have time to talk about, which is that. Um, uh, you know, one one thing that differs a lot is uh, um, between Hank and Rank models is the effect of uh, persistence in the in the uh, in in cutting interest rates. So a very persistent monetary uh, expansion is going to be a lot less powerful in Hank uh, than than in, in Rank. Okay, um, there's also something else in the paper. Let me skip this. Let me also skip this. Okay, so I think just on time. So let me conclude. Um, so the key thing here is that the uh, monetary transmission in rank is very different from Hank. Okay, in particular, we have these uh, direct and indirect effects that are uh, in the the indirect effects are just much more important in Hank than in rank. So another way of saying this, again, coming back to the to the uh, thing from the introduction, is that our Hank model kind of has a large multiplier. Okay, so in particular um it kind of revives this sort of old keynesian uh, cross maybe a little bit and that you may know from your undergrad and that it's all about these indirect multiplier type effects okay um i think i've already said uh, how this works just one thing to 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 conclude um which is the thing at the bottom 
So one way to think about this maybe then is um, sort of uh, a, a sort of slightly provocative question, maybe for people at central banks. So a th thing that this kind of model sort of suggests is that um, the central bank is much less in control of controlling aggregate consumption than we would have thought, at least uh, through the lens of a rank model. Right? In a rank model, monetary policy is very powerful. So you cut real rates. Um, all that has to happen is that household substitute intertemporal. We're just saying, forget about this intertemporal substitution channel. We just don't think that's relevant. Instead, monetary policy has to either work through these interest rate, uh, uh, through these indirect effects, or through balance sheets effect, basically. Um, okay, then finally, just for completeness, we're working uh, a bit on on perturbation methods for these kind of models, and so this is mainly relevant for those of you who work at central banks. So the key idea here will be to then be able to estimate these models and do inference in the same way that people. Uh, estimate and do inference with these uh, representative agent type uh, rank models. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Do you have any questions? We could open your microphone or you can continue using the chat window as you did during the presentation. Okay, I'm I'm happy to take questions any way you want. It seems that there are no further questions. Uh, Benjamin Francisco, are you there? Yeah. So you, you disabled your microphone. Okay. Okay. So there are no further questions. Then I guess we, we close the seminar here. So thank you very much, Ben, for, for the presentation. It was super interesting. And I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as, as I did. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for setting this up. It was a fun webinar. Thanks for good questions. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.